Hello, friends, and welcome to the sixth episode of a special Weekly Witness series introducing Texas Impact's legislative priorities for the next biennium. My name is Scott Atnip, your host and Texas Impact's Director of Public Witness, and this week we continue our series with a discussion about protecting LGBT rights and what Texans of faith can do. During the series, we'll welcome a faith leader to help introduce a section of the legislative priorities and have a conversation about why it's an important priority to the Texas faith community. Then we'll be joined by a member of the Texas Impact team to help us prepare for the policy conversations we'll need to have leading up to the upcoming election and the legislative session. Here with us for the conversation today is Bishop Suffragan K. Ryan with the Episcopal Diocese of Texas and Texas Impact's Advocacy Director, Josh Houston. This episode is part of a 10-part series on Texas Impact's legislative priorities. You can find the full set at texasimpact.org. We hope you'll share both the priorities and the series with your congregation and groups. And if you need a refresher on where they come from, the first two episodes in this series feature board members and staff talking about just that. And y'all, I probably don't need to remind this group of listeners that election season is coming. But when we talk about these priorities, we must remember that what happens in regard to each of these priorities will be decided at the ballot box. So make sure that you're checking Texas Impact's Election Center at texasimpact.org to find out how you and your congregation can help your communities participate in election 2022. So with that, here we go. Our conversation with Bishop Suffragan K. Ryan. Joining us for today's conversation is a repeat guest, Bishop Suffragan K. Ryan with the Episcopal Diocese of Texas. Bishop Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you today, Scott. I think the last time we were together was pre-pandemic and we were sitting in the Texas Impact office at a table and we were using my phone to like Facebook Live and record the the episode. So we've come a long way since then. I appreciate you coming back and giving us another chance. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, So as we go through this series, uh, we're talking about uh, Texas Impact's consensus legislative priorities. And some of these issues have been on our legislative agenda since 1973. I wasn't with the organization then, but has been on Texas Impact's legislative priorities for a long time. And many faith traditions have, uh, have had time to study and learn and grow on a lot of these issues, but, but, but some it's taken some more time. Uh, in particular, the issue that we're talking about today, uh, talking about protections for the LGBT community. So I wonder if you could talk to us about your theology of inclusion or, or the theology behind equality for the LGBT community specifically. Absolutely. So, you know, our, Christ, our Christian faith, faith is based on the idea that Christ became incarnate in human flesh, thus sanctifying all human flesh. And the understanding in Genesis that all people are created in the image of God. And as Paul writes in, in uh, Romans, there is no distinction. So across the diversity of humanity, every person is loved by God, equally valued by God, and equally um, important and uh, deserving of, the, of respect and opportunities for safety, security, and thriving um, in this world. And that's based in our understanding of the nature of God and of humanity. It seems so simple when you say it that way. I wish we could all live into that a little better. Uh, talk to us some, because this has been a journey for, for many people, um, many listeners, many faith communities. Uh, can you talk to us some about the work the Episcopal Church uh, has done in this area? Sure. So just a basis, back in 1976, so just after we, uh, Texas Impact made this a priority. Uh, the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, which is the nat- national gathering that happens every three years, passed a resolution that said homosexual persons are children of God who have a full and equal claim with all other persons upon the love, acceptance, and pastoral concern and care of the church, and that they're entitled to equal protection of the laws with all other citizens. Now, that work has continued, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but just to say that it's based 
on that understanding, um, and it goes back to 1976. The Episcopal Church did a lot of work in response to the AIDS crisis, um, especially creating the National Episcopal AIDS Coalition in 1988 to provide education and support for HIV and AIDS ministries across the Episcopal Church, and then continued um, passing canons, which is the so are our church laws to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and equal access to the rights and worship of the Episcopal Church, including ordination. That was in 1994. In 2012, it called for the repeal of discriminatory federal laws, in, increased legal protections for domestic partners, and recommended a liturgy for same-sex couples. And in 2000. And 12, the canons of the Episcopal Church were amended to prohibit discrimination in the ordination process based on gender identity and gender expression. So the church has focused, the Episcopal Church has focused both on um, the full inclusion of LGBTQ people in the church and on advocating for fair laws and protections um, in in the civil realm. Uh, just after uh, the Supreme Court said that marriage was available to all persons in 2015, the Episcopal Church voted to amend the rules of the church that regulate marriage, permitting any couple the right of holy matrimony. And they also called for a name change right to honor uh, those who are transitioning to be able to claim their true identity. This summer, um, actually last spring, when the House of Bishops, which is all the bishops in the Episcopal Church met, uh, the bishops passed a, a mind of the House calling for the end to uh, the laws that were popping up in states across the country targeting uh, transgender health care and uh, the parents of transgender children um, and and repeated and expanded those calls this summer at General Convention, calling for the Episcopal Church to advocate for um, access to gender-affirming care in all forms, social, medical, or any other, um, at all ages as part of the baptismal call to respect the dignity of every human being. Now, we've gotten a lot of grief over that last one. Um, we're not advocating for, for instance, uh, gender changing surgery for young children. That's a uh, uh, misrepresentation. Um, and so I just want to be clear that, that uh, but, but the, well, we'll get into that later, but we continue to work for protection um, and for equal access to medical care, mental health care, like every person in the United States expects without interference by the government in that access. I feel like I have to ask you because uh, for many of us who are part of connectional denominations or the connectional church, when we go to um, to conventions or, or worldwide or, or United States uh, wide gatherings and we hear resolutions like that passed, I, I feel like as a Texan, <laughs> um, it's sometimes like, oh, you're, you're talking about us right now. Um, this is something that the folks in Texas uh, really need to be hearing. Do you have any of that sense when you're in gatherings like that and resolutions like that are passed? I do, but but interestingly enough, Scott, it was a bishop of Texas who proposed the mind of the house in the spring because mm -hmm. it was so raw here, and yeah. there was so I mean the I sat in uh, the education committee's debate on transgender children being allowed access to sports, right. and it was so devastating hearing the things said about transgender children um, that I was just heartbroken. And so when I went to the House of Bishops, um, you know, we, we, we proposed that and, it, and actually named Texas. Right. And expected, did not expect it to go smoothly, frankly. Um, but, but dozens of other bishops from other states you know, there's 25 or 28 states, at least, in which anti-trans bills have been proposed. 
So it's not just Texas. This is a yeah. crisis across our country. We all need to hear it. Um, and we Absolutely. all need to hear it beyond sort of this political divide to be about um, the the actual lives of people um, who are who are trying to to live and who are and parents who are facing significant um, dangers for their children who are trans. Yeah, and I think it's important that you say in that answer that that people of faith in Texas, the denominational bodies that 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 faith institutions are making clear statements on behalf of equality for all people. And you talked about being there um, as witness and, and providing all of the Texans of faith that, that provided testimony um, during these. But when in the public consciousness, uh, when the media talks about, um, you know, religious folks, they almost always default to the views of uh, white evangelical Christians as, as the only voice on these issues without paying attention to the incredible work that so many mainstream, mainline Texans of faith are, are doing. So how can mainline communities of faith help combat that narrative? Well, I want to push back a little bit on your characterization, um, sure. Scott, about white evangelical Christians, which is certainly what the media tends to call those whose voices they're characterizing. But there are plenty of white evangelical Episcopalians who are not Fair advocating enough. for and so I want to I want to defend I want to defend the label evangelical as being a, a a label about proclaiming good news, which is what we're about in the Episcopal Church. Um, I don't know who I, I don't that. I don't know how you actually would as a body name those who have a literalistic view of scripture. But our understandings and our advocacy is based in scripture. Um, mm. And I think that one of the ways that we combat that is continuing to show up and speak up, but also one of the things that the mainline denominations sometimes tend to do when they advocate politically is they speak politically. And it's important that we teach our own people how to talk about their faith, that we help them um, articulate where in Scripture it says that God loves all, um, that, you know, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is no other man or woman, that, that when people claim for Christianity um, intolerance and oppression and the right to exclude and oppress, um, that they're not speaking for Christianity. They're speaking out of their own narrow political bias. Right. I mean, I think that's part of the thing is that we actually need to claim our faith and equip our people more. I know that's great work that Texas Impact does, which I appreciate, um, but that we need to do better in our own congregations, in our own denominations. Absolutely. I think, and we'll work offline about how to, how I can uh, phrase that question better next time for the next well, speaker. So. Get in your, no, it's just, it's, it's a hard, it, that, that's actually a hard thing is that that's Christianity is complex. Yeah. And how do we, how do we summarize those voices? But they're not, I, I yeah. Yeah. But I, I do think you're I, I, really good point in saying that uh, you have these, these national bodies, um, these international bodies uh, who are making important statements and we can all do a better job of making sure that people in the pews are equipped with that information and are thinking through these issues, not just through a political lens, but through a faith lens. Uh, and so yeah. that's really important. Um, one of the things that we hope that people would do after we have those conversations um, is not just keep it inside the congregation, but take that information and go have conversations with the people who we elect to make those changes, right? Uh, by meeting Absolutely. with and building relationships with our elected representatives. So as people are having those conversations over the next few months, um, what do you wish, what do you hope their, their message would be um, on the issue of LGBTQ equality? Well, I think that it's important for them to say to the legislators that people's lives are at risk that um, our fellow citizens are having their rights denied or abridged, their privacy violated, and their worth questioned because of their identity or who they love. Um, they're being denied equal protection under the law, which our Constitution guarantees. Um, the Declaration of Independence says that all are created with unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
And it just so much of the laws that are being proposed are scapegoating small groups of people instead of addressing some of the huge issues that are facing far a far greater number of people. But people's lives are at risk. That young people who are um, LGBTQ young people have a much higher risk of suicide, um, of trauma, of mental health issues, of being ending up homeless. Um, and when we target them with these laws, um, we increase their trauma, we demean them, dehumanize them, and drive that, um, drive that impulse towards self-harm. We need to tell legislators that all people are worthy of their concern and that they're called to protect the rights of all people. Um, and, and when our legislators wor- refuse to work together across party lines, uh, I don't know if they should really say this to them, but, but I wish our legislators w- would hear that when they refuse to work together for the good of all people, that they're actually, it's a dereliction of their duty as, as elected officials. We need them to care about all of our citizens equally and protect them all equally. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, Love that. And I I also think, especially on this issue, um, it is important that we identify ourselves as people of faith who come to this position because of our faith, uh, because there are so many people who are representing this issue um, on the other side uh, who are claiming to speak for all Christians, for example. Um, and so, yes. so I do think it's important that, that we let people know that there are a lot of really faithful people out there in their communities um, that they serve who, who come about this um, from, a, from, from a different angle because of faith, right? Yes, thank you, thank you. I should have said that first, but absolutely, okay. that, is, that is a key, that, that we come as people of faith, grounded in our faith, um, to call upon them to pass laws that protect all people. I do think it's been a a scary time for a lot of families um, in Texas on this issue because of uh, statements and actions of state government, which is is disheartening, um, to say the least. Uh, I wonder if you have a word of hope uh, that you could give to families who might be living in fear right now uh, because of uh, the potential for state government to do harm. I want them to know they have allies in the church and that they can reach out to communities that will stand with them, um, that we're working for them. I want them to know that they are of worth, that they're of ultimate value to God and to us, um, that, uh, that we're working to overturn the, the laws that will impact them. And that especially in this moment, I, um, when our CPS is focused on investigating uh, families of transgender kids instead of taking care of the mess of our foster system, for instance, um, that we're that we are here for them, and that it does get better. Um, it will get better. Amen. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much, Bishop Ryan. Uh, I give you, I want to give you a chance at the end. Any shameless plugs you want to leave us with today? Absolutely. I want to tell you that the Seminary of the Southwest, which is our Episcopal Seminary in Austin. A few blocks away. A few blocks from here, offers a K. Kreps accredited Master of Arts in Mental Health Counseling. And it's also offered in a Latinx concentration. The program integrates spirituality and psychology, and our graduates are helping meet the enormous mental health needs in Texas and beyond. There are scholarships. SSW. Edu. Love it. All right, friends, check that out. Bishop Ryan, thank you so much for the time today. Uh, but more, I really appreciate uh, your faithful leadership uh, here uh, in Texas, as well as within the Episcopal Church. Um, thank you so much for all you do, and thanks for the time today. Thank you, Scott. This week's episode was brought to you by Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas. <laughs> Welcoming back to the program, we have Texas Impacts Advocacy Director Joshua Houston. Josh, welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be back, Scott. 
you know, I've missed you the last few weeks. I, I don't know if you heard, but last week was the 200th episode, and it really felt like you and I should have had a long chat about something on that day. We could have talked about feelings of life and the podcast and everything else, but uh, we missed you. Oh, well, well, thank you. I, I did see you just three days ago, though. I did see you just a few days ago. Also, uh, I, I should have gone back to count to see how many of those 200 episodes you've been on, but it's probably more than half, right? I have no idea. All right. Well, we'll make that a project for the future. Uh, we did just wrap up the interview, and you had a chance to listen in to the conversation with Bishop Ryan. And this is an issue that you've worked on a lot. And I wonder if you have any reaction, first, to that conversation, but also why it's important for faith leaders like Bishop Ryan to speak up, uh, especially on issues that, that relate to LGBT equality. Well, you're speaking for myself. I mean, one, I, I didn't realize that the Episcopalian advocacy uh, had gone back all the way to 1976. That was yeah, it's probably something too. I learned. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty cool to learn. Uh, which brings me to why it's so important, which is it was really nice to kind of look over and see the institutional church there beside you. Um that is speaking for myself as a as an advocate, the, as a lobbyist uh, that goes into the legislature, um, you know, for Texas Impact and, and our membership. Uh, but if I feel that way, um, affected people desperately, uh, I would assume uh, would want that even more than than for myself. And I know it was really uh, uh, important for me to hear. Uh, a bishop of, of a major institutional church um, walking alongside uh, and, and, and this work um, with us. Yeah, and I think, it's, especially for me this week, so my my community is having a big fight right now about books and libraries that have to do with LGBT kids' books and that kind of thing. And uh, so much of the language has to do with, you know, more... Um, more conservative Christian folks uh, having theology that would be in the opposite direction of of us and Bishop Ryan. And so I, especially this week, I was thankful for faith leaders who are willing to speak on this topic. Yes, yes. So that said, as we go throughout uh, this uh, this series, the purpose of the series is to talk about um, Texas Impact's legislative priorities. And we're talking about LGBT equality today. And so I wonder if you can walk us through uh, those priorities and what you're watching for in regards to this topic. Yeah, well, obviously, one of the big things we're going to see come up is, is issues involving tr individuals who identify as trans. Uh, as trans. Um, that's obvious. It, you can hear the rhetoric. You see it coming. Uh, they're going to continue to fixate on, on children that are identify as trans. Um, they're going to fixate on prohibiting gender-affirming care, uh, which has some really interesting uh, overlap with their desire to prohibit other forms of health care uh, for women, uh, in particular abortion. Uh, and then they're going to fixate on other cultural issues such as drag shows. I think that'll be a bill we see and, and uh, it will be interesting to, to figure out how to engage that sort of thing. Uh, the reason is, is obvious. The religious right has looked at polling data that shows that the public really lacks an understanding uh, of uh, trans issues, of, of, of people who identify as trans. This enables the religious right and then their political allies to frame it. And really, it feels like we're almost at an educational moment where issues involving people who are trans are two decades behind uh, the various issues for, for lesbians and gays like marriage equality. Uh, so when you look at polling on marriage equality, it's a super majority of Americans that support it. And then when you look at the polling for, for uh, issues affecting um, people who are trans, um, it's uh, kind of all over the place and, and really uh, reveals a lack of understanding. So we're going to have to fight on that front, and it is not terrain that we have chosen, which means we're going to be at a major disadvantage uh, because it's terrain the religious right has chosen to frame on. And then a big second issue, if you want me just to kind of launch into it, Scott, um, Yes, you brought it up, though, is schools. Um, and, you know, make no mistake, uh, the agenda of Christian nationalists in schools reveals why we must work on all issues of equality, especially trans issues. Uh, you know, they, they may have chosen the terrain of trans issues because of a lack of understanding, but their work in schools reveals that their agenda is much broader. It's about race. It's about gender, and it's about religion. Um, 
you know, gender affirming care is health care, just like abortion is health care. The books that they are banning pertain to race, just like the other books they want to ban pertain to sexual orientation and gender identity. They're not making a distinction. They're just wanting to ban these books because they don't like them and they're, they're, it's race-based and it's uh, gender-based. And then finally, this in God we trust issue. Uh, they are, you know, making it up as they go as, as other uh, people point out, well, we can put in God we trust in Arabic or in other languages, including Arabic. Uh, or we can put in God we trust in in uh, whatever color we choose, including rainbow colors, which would then signify a a affirming faith uh, that I know you and I hold. Uh, and of course, that then draws objection, which reveals what the real agenda is. And of course, what we would say about that is that that's why we have separation of church and state, and schools shouldn't be involved in this at all. But here we are. And, you know, those advocates are, are, are helping to reveal what the real agenda is. Uh, so if you are, you know, Muslim, if you are of uh, a non-male gender, I suppose is one way to say it. If you are of a non-white race, uh, it is coming out uh, in these local fights at the public schools. Which finally brings me to a third area um, that we are seeing increasingly, and we've seen it increasingly for, for more than a decade, which is violence. Um, this rhetoric is turning into violence. Uh, we see violence against racial minorities, violence against gender-based uh, gender based violence, and, and violence aimed at other religions. And so I think speaking to uh, the Christians, we have a lot to learn from our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters about, one, how to protect ourselves and our, and our congregations, because they have had to deal with this before. We also have a lot to learn from them about how to de-radicalize the extremists among us, including at our Thanksgiving dinner tables. Uh, and on a policy front, however, though, uh, we have a very serious question about what the Department of Public Safety is doing when they aren't standing around outside elementary schools. They have fusion centers, which are intelligence and information sharing databases. Uh, and are those fusion centers being used to monitor extremists? Uh, what are they doing to make sure that they're not being infiltrated within their own ranks by some of the folks that participated in the January 6th insurrection? We had a report from the Anti-Defamation League just a couple within the last couple of weeks uh, showing that, in indeed, we have three percenters and oath keepers who were uh, within uh, Texas law enforcement. So what is the Department of Public Safety doing to uh, actually protect religious institutions, um, actually protect the public, and to make sure that they aren't being infiltrated by some of these same folks uh, that would overturn our democracy? And if they don't want to tell us, okay, where is the Legislative Oversight Committee that they do tell what they're up to? Just like at the federal level, you have uh, congressional oversight committees that oversee law enforcement. Well, where's the legislative oversight committee in Texas uh, that the Department of Public Safety does indeed answer to? And, and, and what have you told them so that the public uh, can be reassured that our mosques and synagogues and houses of worship can be reassured that the Department of Public Safety is watching these extreme elements in our society? So definitely a lot going on in this set of legislative priorities. And during the legislative session, we'll keep folks up to speed, right? Because these are going to change, they're going to evolve, they're going to shift uh, throughout the course of a legislative session. And so we hope people are signed up for a legislative engagement group or rapid response team or, or an issue champion so that they can, they can stay up, up to date. Uh, but a lot of this that's going to be decided during the legislative session um, or discussed during the legislative session will actually be decided over the course of the next few months. Right. And so what do you hope people will do? Um, what's your homework assignment for listeners over the course of the next few weeks as we prepare for the legislature coming in? Yeah, the big homework assignment really is to look at your ballot all the way down, uh, especially at the local level. Uh, and I really want to, to uh, kind of stress why this is strategically so critical. I mean, if you're watching the news, you're going to see big fights about equality between the executive branch, meaning the president and the Biden administration, and in the judiciary, meaning federal courts. The executive branch will do some things that are within their power. Republican state attorney generals will sue. Uh, there will be contradictory things coming out of different courts because our judiciary is polarized. Um, you know, again, 
that's what will make the news. But executive action is only as strong as it only lasts as long as as the executive in in the Oval Office. That's not strategy. And the strategy of going to federal court to assert our rights um, is over. It, it, you could put a tombstone on it and put the dates 1937 to 2022. The real focus has to be on legislative branches. And so we're still, uh, again, at the federal level, but we want to work our way on down, right? So at the federal level, you have Congress. Congress is working on a thing called the Respect for Marriage Act. It is uh, going to codify a couple of existing Supreme Court opinions, the one on interracial marriage and the one on same-sex marriage, so that this current Supreme Court doesn't overturn those things. Uh, it has been postponed until after the election, which reveals to political professionals that it might actually have a chance of passing. Uh, and it's not just a political stunt, that there is some hope that the uh, uh, leader Schumer has that he can maybe get the 10 Republicans necessary. Now, it's a stretch. It's, it's dubious, uh, but but possible. Otherwise, I don't I speak. Uh, the uh, leader Schumer probably would not have done that. Uh, but again, this is all federal. Uh, and if you've heard us say anything for, for decades now, it's to turn off cable news and buy a local newspaper because the real action is state and local. And that is still super true. It's probably more true than ever. You see this playing out at a school board level. So, yes, we want you to talk to your state representative about these issues. But the fastest way to change the Texas legislature is to have a pro-equality Republican win a primary. Uh, and, But for that to happen, we're sitting here in September of 2022. Uh, it won't happen again, and, and you won't have a chance for that to happen again until March of 2024. And we've got to go through the 88th legislature before we get to that opportunity again. Which brings me to what happens local. Uh, and we think that the most important work is happening at a very local level. Uh, city, county, and school board level, uh, where your local government, your city council, or your county government could pass local non-discrimination ordinances. And these are super important uh, because to get the local electeds to support it then provides the support and the cover and the pressure on state legislatures, especially in the uh, legislators, especially in the Texas House. Uh, and so you have many cities who have begun to do this uh, locally. So there's already model ordinances out there and getting your local uh, governments to to protect uh, against discrimination in housing and employment at a local level is, is well worth your time. At the school boards, there's a full-blown assault on equality, race, gender, religion. Uh, the way you help is to organize locally. And so how do you do that? Well, who are you? Are you a mom with kids in schools, in the school? Talk to other moms. Get together. Defend your kids. Uh, you know, all the talk of school board takeovers is, I don't want to say it's overblown, it's very real. Uh, it's also uh, news articles about, about you know, roughly 12 seats out of nearly 10,000 uh, school board seats in Texas. So 12 out of 10,000 is not a great sample. Uh, we can also give you 12 more examples of where the pro-equality candidate won. Um, you know, we did that in a previous episode of Weekly Witness. Uh, but the reason that happened is because there was local infrastructure, a local group a, to help support those people in office, to support their vote uh, for equality. And so those moms groups are super important. Uh, if you're older and don't have a child in school, but you're part of an inclusive church, uh, do you have an LGBTQ ministry? Uh, do you have an anti-racism task force? Anything like that operating at a local church level? If so, then let's get beyond reading books. Let's get a list of people that participate in that group. Let's look at where each of those uh, parishioners, uh, people, members of that group live. Uh, what cities do they live in? What counties do they live in? What school boards uh, do they uh, do they live in? Find out who's running. Find out when they're up. Are they elected in May? Are they elected in November? Uh, and uh, find out where they're at on equality. Um, you know, don't wait until the Department of uh, Child Protective Services shows up at a church member's door. 
before you realize who is in office uh, and that who is in office affects your parishioners. All right, there's definitely important work to be done over the course of the next few weeks and months, both organizing at the local level, um, voting, which Josh will be talking about or has been talking about at all of these faith and democracy uh, events. Uh, but friends, we've got work to do. Uh, Josh, thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I want to thank our guests today, Bishop K. Ryan and Josh Houston. But I especially want to thank you for tuning in. And I hope you'll plan on tuning in and sharing the series with your friends and networks. We're excited both about the guests we'll have joining us and the content we'll be covering in the coming weeks. And remember, and remember, the goal of the series is to have Texans of Faith consider our priorities and give you the tools to have conversations with your representatives and candidates for office about these priorities. And the most important tool in the toolbox this week is Texas Impact's Election Center. So go check out those resources and let us know if you have any questions. If you do have questions or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at scott at texasimpact.org. And leave us a rating or review and leave a comment for us in the feed. We want to hear from you and we want even more people to find us. So work that algorithm. And with that, I think it's time to close out this episode. So make sure you're subscribed and sharing and go ahead and check to make sure that you are following Texas Impact social media. Then head on over to texasimpact.org and make sure you and your congregation are members of Texas Impact and supporting this important work. Friends, election season is upon us. Now is the time for Texans of Faith to engage our communities and networks. The world needs Texans of Faith active and engaged. So let's get to work. Weekly Witness is hosted by Scott Atnett, engineered and produced by David Pasallo. Our executive producer is B. Moorhead. The opinions expressed on Weekly Witness are those of Texas Impact and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of our sponsors. Weekly Witness is a product of Texas Impact, people of faith working for justice. Visit us online at texasimpact.org.